The following program is sponsored by the Building Wisconsin Television Network. Welcome to Building Wisconsin. I'm Stuart Keith and on today's show, well, we're learning more about the apprenticeship program with the Wisconsin Operating Engineers. Now, later in today's show, we have a chance to visit their training center here in Coloma as we catch up with Dan Sperberg. But let's get started with Terry McGowan, who's out on location at a road construction project. Terry, thanks for coming on Building Wisconsin. Great to see you again. And wow, what a perfect project for today's show. There's a lot of activity going on here. There's a lot of activity. You know, there's, there's a lot of earthwork being done. Uh, obviously, there's a bridge structure, several bridge structures being done on this stretch near Mauston, Wisconsin. And we've got uh, Bashuda doing our earthwork, and we've got Lunda doing our bridge work. Sure, and you said right near Mauston, we're along Interstate 9094, and I know personally, I've driven on this a lot, a lot of frustrating times on a Friday afternoon in the summer. I mean, it always seemed to be a bottleneck, but this is a great example of rebuilding our infrastructure and in one of the projects going on in our state right now. And we look forward to many more, Stu, and this is going to help tourism in Wisconsin. This is going to help the tourists to say, you know what, I wasn't sitting in traffic all day. They have a very good infrastructure system. I was able to get to my cabin. I was able to get home without being in a parking lot. Sure. Well, before we get into the specifics of building bridges, I have to jump to safety because that's the first thing that pops to my mind. We're right along the road. There's some concrete structures there to help protect the individuals that are working out here, but that has to be paramount on a project like this. This illustrates exactly what we try to tell the general public. We've got people working just on the other side of a barrier with traffic coming by all day long. Their heads on a swivel. We also ask the motoring public to please be patient and to please be aware of these workers. Yeah, definitely. They want to go home at night just like we want them to go home at night. That's yeah. for sure. Yes. Okay, so let's get into the project specifics here. I mean, you mentioned there's Mashuda and there's Lunda, your members working here. Tell us about this crane. I mean, I just love cranes. Who's <laughs> running that? Well, that's Al. Al is. One of our members, he's been a member for a long time. He's, he's getting to the age where he's thinking about retiring, although he looks way too young. He's in pretty good shape. <laughs> but he does have a younger member working under him. Uh, that's called an oiler. Now, uh, the, the old purpose of an oiler is, is kind of outdated. They, the, the name is stuck with them. We like to call them apprentice oilers. Although Ben, his oiler, is a journey worker, and he is learning how to run that crane. Every once in a while, Al lets him in the seat, and he's going to pass the torch on so we have another crane operator for tomorrow. Wow, and all this training, you know, we always talk about the training at Coloma, but this is, illustrates that mentoring that goes on on the job site where they learn an awful lot. Yeah, Ben has been through our apprenticeship. Ben has been through our school. And in fact, I was talking to him earlier, and he just couldn't say enough about our school. And he's also CCO certified from our school. That's awesome, and I love that he wants to advance his career by gleaning some knowledge from Al, and eventually he's the next generation of crane operators. Yes. Okay, let's get into the specifics. How do you build a bridge when you're crossing it? Talking to Derek from Mashuda, he was saying there's three bridges being built, eastbound and westbound? Well, this particular bridge, uh, they had to build a coffer dam because they're going through the Lemon Weir River. Okay. And they have a pier right in the middle right now, and they're getting ready to pour that in a very short while. The abutments will be poured tomorrow, 
and they displace the water to make room for the concrete, and that's how they do it. It's quite a skill. That is really cool to see, yeah. and it's not something you do overnight. I mean, this has been going on for quite a while. It, it's been going on for quite a while, and, and you know, this is why Wisconsin bridge builders are the best. I mean, these guys have been doing this. They have a trained workforce that's come through our training center, and it's so enlightening to see young people like this get experience coming across a river like this with a bridge deck. So I, I, sure. I can't say enough. Sure, and you know, we are so fortunate here in Wisconsin on a number of different fronts, but the highly skilled, highly trained workforce is one of them, and when you're talking infrastructure rebuilding, I mean, it's at the forefront. A few years back, the legislature was getting rid of prevailing wage, and there's a, a worry out there that, oh my gosh, all these out-of-state contractors are gonna come in. Are these all your guys here? I mean, where do we stand on that front? Well, these are all our guys, and yes, that was one of their selling points. Number one, they said highway costs would come down 20%. Well, you know what, labor is 20%. We have yet to find anyone that'll do this type of work for free. Yeah. Okay, so yes, we had a number of out-of-state contractors try to bid Wisconsin DOT work. You know what they found? They found they cannot compete with our home contractors because of the skill that we provide, the labor that we provide. They couldn't compete. So basically the legislators ran us through this kabuki dance for nothing. Sure. That's, a, that's amazing, but it's good news to hear that it's still our local individuals building our roads, highways, and bridges. Absolutely. Now there's been a few out-of-state contractors, Stu, I will point out, that came in and bid some work. They were able to competitively bid, but they were also signatory to us. So we were able to provide our workforce, our skilled trained workforce to these companies, and they're still building their own highways. Yeah, sure. Hey, if Wisconsin taxpayers are gonna pay for these roads, we may as well have Wisconsin workers building it, right? Exactly. I mean, we pounded that on the show and everybody I talked to agrees. I mean, how can you argue against that? If you have the highly skilled, highly trained workforce, they're willing to do the work. Let's hire it locally when possible. And we are providing a really good product for a really good price to the Wisconsin taxpayers. And we proved it. Okay. Well, this is mostly Lunda work going on right now. Mashuda's here as well. What are they up to? Well, they're putting in some pipe on the other end. They're digging some trenches and they're finishing off some ramps. Let's go take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. So we're back here at this intersection and you know, you see all the different pieces of equipment. But one thing we don't see is what's underground. And you were talking about water management. Mashuda in the background looks like they're laying some of this concrete pipe. This is what's gonna manage the water that falls on the highway? Yes, displacement of water is huge in highway construction. You have to displace a lot of water in anticipation of a deluge coming from the sky. You know, I think it's fair to say that it's out of sight, out of mind. And until you encounter a heavy rainstorm and start hydroplaning, that's when it really sinks so like, holy cow, we need water management. This is inadequate water displacement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And maybe not in those specific terms, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's imperative to any highway project to have proper water management. Yes, it is. So what they do here is they efficiently displace that water so it doesn't become a danger to the motoring public. Boy, just think how precise they have to be because these can't be laid level there or they'd fill up. So all that water has to be pitched correctly and drained safely away from this interchange. Another important component of highway construction, along with relocation of a lot of the utilities, they may otherwise be in the way of the new road. Sure. Well, everything you're talking about here revolves around safety and whether it's the safety of the construction workers or the general public when the project is completed, you want it to be safe when it's done. Yeah, exactly, Stu. That's part of the three-legged stool. You know, we want to give the taxpayers a great product. We want to bring it in budget, and we want our workers home safe. Well, I couldn't say it better myself. And, you know, whether it's this project here or any of the infrastructure projects that are going on in our state right now, can Coloma provide the manpower, the workforce needed to complete all these projects? Well, we're anticipating it, Stu. Our infrastructure was crumbly. We knew that there was going to be a need. The bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed in Washington, D.C. is going to last about 10 years the way we're figuring it right now. So in anticipation of that, we are putting, through the permission of our membership, we are building a $20 million addition to our training center. Wow, that's outstanding news. I mean, that's a big facility as it is, but I love the foresight that you and your members have. Yes, and you know what? We, we told the members we anticipate 800 apprentices this year alone. And we're gonna exceed that. Once this infrastructure bill starts rolling down the highway, proverbial highway, <laughs> yeah. 
then we are going to have the need for young apprentices to come up behind some of the folks that are retiring right now. Well, let's hire local and let's make sure they're highly trained, highly skilled, coming out of Coloma. We can't get a better value than that. And let's get some young people involved. Well, Terry, I appreciate you coming on today's show. It's always fun to catch up with you at these construction sites. Look forward to seeing you again in the future. Right now, I'm going to head over to Coloma, catch up with Dan to learn more about that exciting news. Good to see you, Steve. Well, Dan, thanks a lot for coming on Building Wisconsin. And I have to be honest with you, I was so excited when I found out we were coming back up here because every time we get to visit this amazing training campus, as I like to refer to it, there seems to be something new. And it seems like only yesterday we were here and this was a new addition that you were so excited about. Well, thank you, Stu, and thank you guys from Building Wisconsin for coming back up here. And you're right, there's continued growth at the training site here. We just keep growing and growing. It's been an amazing program. Right now, the building you see right here is our indoor training arena. 300 feet long, 180 feet wide, 86 feet from the top to the bottom. Year-round, we're doing training right now. So in the middle of winter time, when it's 10 below and 20 below, we can still have our members come up here from over the whole state and come and take classes yet to give us the ability of doing that here in Wisconsin. And again, the magnitude of this is amazing. I look out there, they look like little Tonka trucks in a sandbox. It's anything but. I mean, these are full-size, real-world pieces of equipment. It is second to none, that's for sure. And is this considered large as far as training centers go? It is. We actually are one of the largest single apprenticeship program in the nation with over 700 young men and women involved in the Operating Engineers Apprenticeship Program, oh. along with our journey workers who come up here for the continuing education classes. So this is one of the largest ones in the nation right now. I tell now. you, we are so fortunate here in our state to have this facility here. And what is your role here? It, it is pretty cool to have this. My role here, I'm the training director, the principal, if you would, of this facility. My job is actually to oversee the classes, I oversee the, the students, the apprentices, and also oversee the equipment also. So I oversee pretty much all of it, and it's a great job to have. Boy, that sounds like a lot of responsibility, but it's perfect for today's show because we wanted to catch up with you to learn more about the apprenticeship program with the operating engineers. And we're gonna do that in a minute. But first, I understand it's very exciting times here. I was just talking to Terry, and he said you have a big addition planned. There is, and I've been here for over 20 years. I keep watching the growth, and now we're looking at putting another addition on, actually a $20 million addition. It's gonna give us more classrooms and an additional shop area for our shop classes. Wow, what was the impetus for that? I mean, the members actually saw the need for growth? It is, we've gotten so big, and this last addition we built in 2015, and since then we've already grown out of this building. So actually we're looking at, again, putting another piece on. We've actually been turning members away the last couple of years because there's just no place to put them. So we said, hey, how do we fix it? The members said, keep growing, keep wow. making it bigger. That's great to hear. And again, my favorite part of that whole story, there's no tax dollars. This is member funded, right? It is completely funded by the members, no tax dollars. The members actually show up at the spring meetings. They say, hey, how's the school doing? They look at it, they say, keep growing. Let's put some more money at it, keep going forward. Well, it's a great organization to be a member of. I'm anxious to learn more about the apprenticeship process. Let's head down and get close to some of this massive equipment. Let's go. First off, let's talk about some of the equipment. Right here we have a John Deere 672 motor grader. This is what a lot of the journey workers operate. There's eight different levers in the cab, steering wheel on top of it. They got different pedals they have to operate. Pretty busy actually when you're inside this cab. The more experienced guys do it, one side of the blade will pick up, the other side of the blade, they can move each one of them separately. It will shift back and forth. So with that, you gotta be on top of your game to run one of these. They use them in the grading industry. The final pass they make on a lot of these for highway projects, for parking lots. So this is what they use and pretty cool. You know, you set eight different levers up there, all kinds of the latest technology. How long does it take for an apprentice to learn how to run something like this? You gotta have a talent. I've seen some people pick it up after a couple of years. Some people after 10 years, they're still getting the feel of it. It's, we're looking for people to run these. There's a lot of talent to get involved with this. Definitely not weekend warrior work where, hey, I took a course for an hour and I learned how to run a grader. No, that's correct. And over here, look at the size of this. 
This is pretty cool. This is a motor scraper for highway projects and building projects. And it scrapes the ground when it's going forward. It scrapes the ground, fills this up with dirt, and that's why they call it a scraper. And they take from one part of the project, could be a big building project or a highway project, and they haul it all the way to the other side of the project. And then they come back and they grab some more. It's kind of a young guy's job. Their whole day is like a big NASCAR race. They grab it from one side, take it to the other side, do a big circle, grab some more, take it to the other side all day long to keep going. You can get 80, 90, 100 loads in a day if you keep really busy. So that's what they're looking for. A lot of production with these, a lot of movement all day long. Sure, and you use the term the NASCAR race. I mean, these can really fly. We've had them on shows in the past at different construction sites, and I was amazed. They're not just going five miles an hour. I mean, they're really moving. No, like I said, it weighs 76,000 pounds, and it'll go for 30 miles an hour on that project. So just bouncy, bouncy, moving all along during the day. And this is an example of the different pieces that the apprentices can learn on to learn and get started with a career? It is. A lot of entry-level people we put in these scrapers or haul trucks. So with that, the apprenticeship program is 6,000 hours. And when we're looking for young men and women, we put them usually in this first, this, a haul truck, a roller, and that's the entry level for our industry for a lot of our members, actually. It's a 6,000 hour apprenticeship program. 400 of it is spent up here at Coloma at the training site. Wow, and so along the lines of the apprenticeship program, there's a lot of people that want to start a rewarding career with the operating engineers. How does it all begin? Sure, when people see all that equipment on a job site and they say, hey, I want to do that one day, they can actually come up here to our information sessions. We host them on a Friday. They come up here, they go through the door, we welcome them at nine o'clock, sit them down, we walk come through of the day of a life of an operating engineer, who we are, what we do. So we're going to tell them the opportunities we have here, what it's going to be like to do this for a whole day, then a whole week and a whole month and on and on for part of their career. So we make them understand that we work when it's really, really hot, work when it's really, really cold. So they get ready for that. You know, we're long days. You can work 12, 14 hours a day sometimes. So we walk them through that kind of day actually in the life of an operating engineer. Okay, it seems to me they get a full tutorial of what it takes to become an operating engineer. And if they're a good fit, then you can help them along to get started with a career. Yep, just that one day when they come up here, we're gonna walk them through who we are, what we do. Then after that, if they're still interested, they'll fill out the application for the apprenticeship program. Then after that, they'll fill out the entrance test. Then they leave here with a letter of eligibility along with an employer list of all the companies in the state of Wisconsin that are looking for apprentice operating engineers. Plus, we do a little mentoring with them, a little guidance counselor work of telling them, hey, where do you live? And, and what do you wanna do? Because again, there's, there's asphalt paving, concrete paving, there's directional boring cranes, you know, dozers, scrapers, graders. We'd see what their interest is besides just saying, I wanna be an operating engineer. What do you wanna be with that? Then we'll tell them, hey, try this your company. Talk to this your company. They're looking for that next generation for their companies. And again, Dan, I just marvel at all the different pieces of equipment here. And this is just a small portion of what you have on site, but the apprentices get to learn on these so that they're prepared when they go out to a job site, they know what to do, right? You're right. Here we have actually the dozer. There's the John Deere product right here, 700L. Yep, we'll put apprentices on here and journey workers. They'll actually go through this. They'll actually work with leveling out a project, pushing out the dirt, actually doing a lot of ditching you can do with this. Over there, a haul truck. We'll put a lot of first-year apprentices, second-year apprentices in that haul truck. They'll move dirt from one side of the project to the other. It's kind of like the same thing the scraper does, but they'll actually top load them actually with a bigger excavator. Here we actually have a smaller excavator. They use that on a lot of projects. They'll put utilities in with that. They'll actually do some foundation work with them. Here we actually have a smaller crane. Broderson is called in some of the building projects. They'll put that. And here's actually his big brother. These are on the big projects. This has over 80 feet of boom. It has a jib on. It'll go over 100 feet away. Wow, look at how huge this is. And this gives an idea of the magnitude of this indoor training facility that can be used year round. I mean, that is a massive crane. And again, how privileged are the members and the apprentices that come here? You find that there's a level of excitement that's hard to compare to anything else? It is. When members come here, and we have over 250 members show up here every week to take different classes, the crane classes, the dozer class, the excavating classes. They'll take them different classes. Just a beehive of classes here in the wintertime. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so let's step back to the apprenticeship program. I mean, what are the steps to complete it? So the apprenticeship program is $6,000 altogether. And with that, they come here, they start taking their first year classes. They take some classes, we put them out to work for different companies. After that, they come back every 1,500 hours, they go up another step in their apprenticeship program to get that at 6,000 hours. And every one of them steps, they actually get a little pay raise also as they continue along their apprenticeship program. And it's involved with actually the 400 hours of classes through during the whole process and the 6,000 hours. And at the very end of that, they become a journey worker. Wow, and it, so it really is earning while you're learning, like we always talk about in the building trades here, but here it involves classroom. What do they learn in the classroom? OSHA, MSHA, go through HAZMAT because we work on some of the HAZMAT projects. After that, there's basic equipment, all the different certifications that they need for an, being an apprentice, operating engineer. Then after that, we get involved with actually different class we have on the equipment, maintenance classes, grade classes, and it goes back again to more equipment-based classes. And again, I remember from previous visits up here, this is a 400-acre facility. There's a lot that goes on out in the different fields here. 
Yep, this is our indoor training arena, but the great part of it is the 400 acres here. We have tower cranes up, larger cranes. We've got cranes that weigh over 100,000 pounds. And then we do all that outside along with all the scraper projects that we do actually also that we talked about. And you know, there's been a big push to get the younger generation into the building trades and the operating engineers are no exception. So what do you offer to somebody in high school? Yep, we are looking for that next generation. So in high school, we're involved with the DCA program, Destination Career Academy. That's where actually kids in high school now, students in high school, get involved with different classes that we offer here at the training site. They're starting with their freshman year, their sophomore, junior, senior year, they can take different classes on maintenance grade. They can also get involved with the equipment nomenclature so they know a little bit of who we are and what we do. So when they graduate, then they can come here and sit through that information session that we talked about and get fast forward right through the apprenticeship program. Oh, that's awesome to hear. And then at the other end of the spectrum, what about an experienced operator? operating engineer who's not currently a member of Operators 139. Do you have any fast track programs for them? We do. We see them every week also during the summertime so we can take them. Instead of the 6,000 hour apprenticeship program, we can cut that in half, take it to 3,000 hours of apprenticeship. And so they're earning as they learn. They don't have to go through the full three, four, five years, whatever it takes to get 6,000 hours. That sounds like a great opportunity if you're experienced out there but not a member of 139. It's a great place to work, right? It is. Well, Dan, again, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Give us a little tour. Next time, I want to cover the whole 400 acres. Thanks for coming on. We will. Thank you. Hard work, sweat, knowledge in your own two hands. These are the tools that build Wisconsin. Leave your mark on the real world with zero debt and higher pay. All from day one. It's time to do work that works for you. Learn more at buildingwisconsintogether.com. Great to see you again, Craig. It's been a couple years since you were last on Building Wisconsin. I appreciate you coming on today's show. And, you know, I'm sure you're extremely busy being Secretary of the Department of Transportation, and that's where I want to start. Tell us what you've been up to and what you oversee with the DOT. Well, it's been great to be here, Stu, again. And, you know, at the DOT, we've got about 3,200 employees. We oversee the different modes of transportation across the entire state. People think of our highways and bridges, which obviously uh, we do, but we've got dozens of commercial ports that are so important uh, to our exports for our agriculture and, and other areas. We've got our general aviation airports as well as our commercial airports. We've got freight rail. We've got passenger rail. We've got mass transit. So we, we've got a lot of different aspects of our transportation system, uh, and, and we oversee and help coordinate all of it. Wow, I can see why you're so busy, that's for sure. Well, on today's show, we're focusing in on road construction and the need for a highly skilled, highly trained workforce to help rebuild our infrastructure. And in our last segment, we had an opportunity to visit the Wisconsin Operating Engineers Training Facility up in Coloma. World class. I mean, yes, it's it is. absolutely amazing up there. And Dan was even telling us it's the largest in the nation. So from your perspective, what does that mean to our state to have a training facility like that? Oh, it's elemental to having good projects done. People ask me all the time that when we're rebuilding these, are we getting the quality? Are they going to last? That has to do with the materials that go in, but it has to do with the quality and the skill of the workforce. These are complicated jobs. And so this training facility and the amount of people that go through that, as you said, the largest in the nation, we've got truly competent, skilled workers coming out that are working on these jobs to make sure that we're doing it the right way and that we've got good quality infrastructure at the end of the project. We want to make sure it's a safe work zone so people better know what they're doing when they're on that work zone. And by the way, Everybody watching this, please slow down in the work zone. That is somebody's brother, sister, mother, father in that work zone. We still have way too many accidents. Put your phone down, buckle up, and slow down in those work zones. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. And hats off to those people that are coming out of that facility because they have a work ethic second to none. And we're fortunate here in Wisconsin to enjoy that work ethic because it leads to a higher quality of life when these projects are completed. We know we hear it from other states and other areas, employers here for this. We do have a higher work ethic here in Wisconsin. And those workers are building our state that is gonna take care of our economy. Families supporting jobs, they learn how to do it the right way. They earn while they learn. And we're gonna need them because we're having a lot of road projects going out here, a lot of bridge projects, and we're gonna need that skilled workforce. And so we'll win on every end. Okay, let's get into the state of our infrastructure. You know, I travel around the state an awful lot, driving on these highways, roads, bridges, whether it's a state road, federal road, or even a 
municipal road like this one. A lot of them seem to be in need of repair. Absolutely. You know, we went decades here in Wisconsin, really since the 80s, without investing more at the state level in our transportation system. And it was one of the things Governor Evers ran on. And actually, in our first budget, uh, we were able to come to agreement with the legislature to finally put new resources, hundreds of millions of dollars, into transportation for the first time in decades. And since then, the, at the department and with our local government partners, we've been able to fix over 1,700 miles of roads, wow. over 1,300 bridges, and that's before the beginning of this construction season. Those numbers will be going up. So that money is being put to good use, but we still have a long way to go with all the lane miles and all the local roads and everything across the state. Well, that's outstanding to hear, and it was long overdue, that's for sure. I know we discussed it on a previous program, so that's good news. Also good news is there's a lot of federal money heading our way from that huge infrastructure bill. Absolutely. First of all, we'll know the amount of money we're getting for the next five years. And that certainty is great for planning in the private sector at the government level. It's about a 25% increase in our overall funding across the board. So that's great for us, but it's also great for the locals because in Wisconsin, we're, we're trying to share as much of that with our local government partners as we possibly can. And so from a local level, a local township, is there going to be money for their projects that are long overdue? Well, you know, for example, there's one component that's just for bridges. We're going to be getting about $45 million a year more from the federal government each year. We've made a decision here in Wisconsin, the legislature agreed, we're taking all of that $225 million over the next five years and giving it all to the locals. So every bit of that's going to go on a town bridge, a county bridge, a municipal bridge. That's just for the bridges. But for our roads as well, we're sharing over half of that money with our local government so that they can increase the pace on which they're fixing their local roads as well. And of course, everybody wants it done yesterday, right? But at a local level, what's your advice to somebody? I mean, how do they actually get access for that? Well, you know, especially when you get into your smaller townships and municipalities, they don't necessarily have a big staff. Now, the county highway commissioners a lot of times will help work with them, but now that they know the money's going to be there, if they are going to, you know, bring on an engineer and, and, and for a project that they know they need to do, there, there's going to be some certainty that at the end of the day, that money won't be wasted, that there's going to be money there to fund their projects. So my advice would be to work with their local government partners, work with us at the state, make sure they know the process, and we'll help them as much as we can uh, to get that money to them and, and, and get it out on the road as, as expeditiously as we can. And boy, just look around at all the local communities, mine in particular. I mean, you look at how a few years ago, the corridor through town, it was decrepit. I mean, it, potholes, it just looked bleak. Last year, it got completed by the DOT all the way through, new sidewalks, everything. It looks beautiful, and there's a sense of pride within the community. So local municipalities should definitely contact the state, learn the process, and apply for it. Let's get our communities built even stronger. Absolutely. There's stories like that all across the state. Then there's also stories where people are waiting and they haven't gotten there yet, and we're very familiar with that. we got a long way to go. But there's been so many projects like that that it, it revitalizes an area. What it means to the local shop owners and businesses is tremendous once we improve that infrastructure. So we're very excited. There's going to be a lot of improvement going on over the next five years here in Wisconsin. And so it sounds, in summary to me, that there's a lot to be optimistic about in our state when you're talking about the transportation system. There really is. You know, you can't go for decades and have the deterioration on city streets and, and county highways and towns roads and our state highways and fix it overnight. Even if you had enough money, you just couldn't do it all at once. But we are making progress over the next three years. This federal money coming in, people are going to see the improvements that are going on in the Fox Valley, in the Cross area, the Wassa area, up in Forest County, Oneida County, all those areas, you're going to see improvement. It's going to be awesome to see all the improvements and reaping the rewards of our investment today for a brighter future tomorrow. Thanks a lot for coming on today's show. Thanks for having me, Stu. For more information on Building Wisconsin, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and be sure to watch additional episodes on YouTube or at our website, buildingwisconsintv.com. The preceding program was sponsored by the Building Wisconsin Television Network.